Hello. Thank you all for coming. My name is Walter Tyler, and I love barns. Really. They were a huge part of my childhood. That's me on my grandparents' farm, front and center with a book in my hands. And they continue to fascinate me. They capture a time past, and they are incredibly practical buildings, but to my childhood mind, they were also huge, mysterious, and magical buildings because they were full of possibilities. My grandfather's barn had all the requisite elements. That's him in the back wearing the yellow shirt. His barn had cows and tractors, corn and straw, but more importantly, it was a world unto its own. It was a world of stories. Have you ever thought about that? The way a place tells stories? This is my father, above the fold of the Akron Beacon Journal, after they published the results of the 2000 census. I love the headline, the world revolves around these places. It's talking about population centers, but metaphorically it's so true. Think about the impact of the place you spent your childhood. I'm not saying all of the memories were fond, they may be tragic, but how rooted are your thoughts about the past and the place they happened? This is an English bank barn. It's the most common type of barn where I grew up. It's the type of barn my grandfather had. Children explore their worlds, and a farm is a world ready to be discovered, in part because of the real estate. A group of cousins can have run of a family farm in a way city kids can't imagine, or even suburban kids. You see animals born, animals taken to slaughter, plants grow, tractors mow, the harvest comes in, and tools and equipment like you wouldn't believe. It's like the book, the way things work, except it's live. It's right in front of you. My grandparents' farm was a big part of my childhood, and it was a big part of my world. I played there until I was old enough to carry a bale of straw, and then I worked there. And farm life is hard life. It's exhausting work, but it's also weirdly satisfying. It has a lot in common with thesis. <laughs> Some of my early memories involve this, drawing the world around me. I always had a pen and paper with me, ready in my pocket, and I still do. And I was already thinking in sequences. This was the next image I drew. So here we have the nauseant idea of sequential imagery. Where did that come from? Here. These were my secret stories. The content coming into my household when I was a kid was fairly controlled. My parents monitored what I watched, what I read. But the newspaper came into the house every night. And like a 50s housewife in her soaps, I read the funnies every night. And we didn't even get the Sunday paper. My grandmother did. So I made her save it, because that one was in color. And like any fledgling artist, I aped what I liked. This is what I wanted to do when I was a child. This is what I was when I was a child. This is the cover of my first collected volume of comic strips, my first book. Meet Ralph was a strip about a precocious, troublemaking only child and his put-upon professor father. Not at all a reflection of my literal life, but given time and the ability to see meaning when they're probably wasn't any, uh, I can see the seeds of a theme, the creative versus the practical, all wrapped up in the dreams of a would-be comic strip artist. So what I'm trying to show with some of these images and moments from my childhood is that it really was story from the beginning. I mean, you saw me with the book in the opening picture. I craved these things. I wanted to make these things. And cartoons, these were things I could make. And this distinction would become important later. Enter the camera. Every family has a chronicler, someone who is interested in documenting daily life. That was me. Because seriously, is there any better way to stay out of the camera's path? I mean, in front of the camera, things like this happen. I'm pretty sure that look was dated even when I wore it. Now, my high school had a dark room, and I loved it. I was always in there. Um, this image is actually the first work of art I ever sold to someone other than friends and family. A bank in Orville, Ohio, bought it for their office wall. And if you can recognize the high contrast image, that's a wooden wagon wheel, so already kind of in the space of what was happening around me and farm life. Okay. 
So I'm gonna to touch on the trauma of childhood while trying not to make this a therapy session, but um, six weeks into the fall term of my freshman year in college, my grandfather died. It was a complete surprise. He had been out working in his field all day. He came home and went to bed that night and he died in his sleep. Now that wasn't the worst thing that ever happened to me but it was a cataclysmic event in my life. I loved him. I was very close to him. And at that moment, I was an hour and a half away at college. How do we mourn from a distance? We don't. We have to return to the places that provoked the memories of our loved one. So I took my camera and I photographed my grandfather's absence. I photographed my grandfather's barn. My grandfather bought the farm when he came home from World War II. He paid the deposit with money he earned cutting hair while he was a soldier. His blood was in that wood, even if he didn't build the barn. Have you ever thought about that? How barns were built? I mean, there are literally thousands of them across this country, many of them built before the age of machines built by hand, but not built by one hand. Entire communities came together for barn raisings and did what they possibly, couldn't possibly do on their own. They made it an event. They made it a party. Communities may have built barns, but barns built communities too. These buildings literally brought people together. The images that I took after my grandfather's death were part of my first gallery show. After college, I became a photojournalist, a chronicler of other people's lives. I did the big stories, I traveled with national sports teams, covered presidential elections, and I did the small stories. I saw people at their best, I saw people at their worst. It was kind of like being part of a sociological study where at the end of the day, you had to weave together a story and present your findings. I loved it, and I hated it. It, too, had a lot in common with thesis. <laughs> what I loved about it was meeting people. A camera gives you permission to enter so many lives, to see how different people live, celebrate, deal with crisis. Always, I went out into the world to do this to the places where the stories were happening. And in that way, the stories were really about those places. In 2003, I had a journalistic idea I couldn't shake. I wanted to tell the story of the people who lived along the old 3C highway that connects Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati. It's basically Ohio's Route 66, a series of connected roadways that were replaced by Interstate 71. I wanted to record the death of the family farm on this half-forgotten roadway, and I wanted to do it by photographing the aging barns and fields and interviewing the people who lived and worked on the land. It's an unfinished project that I hope someday to return to. I mention it here because of the connective tissue. Barns, places, people's stories. Around that time, I came across a book. Now, I can't tell you why I started looking at children's books. I had arrived at an age where Certainly people around me were having children, um, but I quickly fell in love and two things happened. I thought this was a perfect contained version of my soaps, those big unending comic strip stories condensed into 32 pages. And the journalist in me saw an opportunity to educate and inform at the same time. And I thought this was really exciting stuff and it was children's books. So I started keeping a folder of ideas and the other thing that happened to me was the book exposed an itch I didn't really know I had. I mean, I'm a paper and pencil kind of guy. I felt I could see the author in something like this. This was a little harder for me to see. Now, I know this is a huge generalization, but the handcrafted, hand-drawn nature of an earlier age appealed to me. It was a significant part of my own artistic development as a child. I could see how it was done, and I could learn by recreating it. And I didn't really want that to be lost. So I knew that that was going to be an important part of my approach. 
So 10 years later, um, a lot happened in between, but let's just pretend there's a fade out. Fade up, I started my first picture book. It was the story of a koala who traveled from Australia to America and learned about the hemispheres and the seasons. And it was not very good. <laughs> But a couple of things were happening here that were really important. I was setting down the camera and returning to art making really for the first time in a long time. And while my visual senses were very developed, my art making skills were perhaps a little bit rusty. And also, I didn't really know the format yet. So I created a series of exercises to get better. And at my wife's suggestion, I self-published them. I chose a familiar starting point, a classic nursery rhyme, Hickory Dickory Dock. And I told my own version of the story with a new animal arriving each hour on the hour to attempt to climb the clock. Then I started doing breakout stories. Each book would feature one of those animals in their own adventure. And putting out the books out into the world helped give me the incentive to keep making them. Look familiar? But what was missing here from these first forays into picture books was something a little deeper. I mean, all of the books that I'd been working on were kind of a lark. And while I had told many other people's stories, complete stranger stories that had touched my life while I was a journalist, I wanted to express what that meant to my own life. So I made a book that was not only inspired by members of my own extended family, but one that touched on something I felt personally engaged with the dilemma between creativity and practicality. Embodied literally in a playful young girl and a very serious young boy, and how they find a balance between their two worlds. And Grown was a turning point, not only in one respect, but another. I produced a behind the scenes book um, showing how the art was made. Like going back to that idea of like the handcrafted nature of something, I just wanted to show that it could be done very simply. These are actually the layouts from Grown. And in the process, I discovered something. It was kind of interesting without the lines. So let's recap for a moment. We have the creative impulse, personal story, journalism, photography, family, place, did I mention I love Barnes? This is my thesis project. It's a children's book about a 19th century barn raising told from the perspective of the farmer's seven-year-old son. And it's inspired by this photograph, a photograph of my family raising a barn in rural Ohio. So here's the math. It was my great, great granduncle's farm. One, two, three, four, five generations back. 200 family, friends, and neighbors came together in the summer of 1888 to build the structure, and a photographer was there to capture the moment. It is very likely that that event would have gone unremembered otherwise. Barn raisings were big events, but they weren't unique. Every farm needed a barn. The family that built the barn built another one nearby the following year. Everyone in this photograph has died. I don't have any sesquicentennians in the family. Even the barn is gone. And yet, the photograph exists. It captures a moment in time. And for me, it suggests a story. Now, the journalist in me was piqued. So last fall, I made a research trip to the Maslin Museum in Northeast Ohio, which owns the original glass negative, and I held it in my hands. It was as close to actually being there as I'll ever get. I mean, that glass was there on the day, witness to the moment. What was that like? To build a barn by hand. And what was it like to be there as a child and witness the creation of this practical, magical building? This felt like fertile ground. So I set forth to tell the story, my story. Now this is my favorite part of picture booking. In the book, I write how barns are kind of like puzzles. 
Well, layouts literally are puzzles. The standard picture book is 32 pages long, cover to cover, including any title pages or back matter, because books are printed in sets of eight. Four times eight is 32. The challenge is in making the story not only fit the format, but feel like it's the exact length it should be. And I initially tried very, very hard to make the new barn fit 32 pages, but my book is actually 40 pages. It's an extra set of eight. The reason is that I'm really telling two stories. The story of a boy named Otto and the story of the barn raising. Now these two narratives eventually come together, but I needed a little extra space to make it feel right. Which meant I also had an extra eight pages of art to produce. And I experimented with a lot of different media, but ultimately chose to produce the art digitally. This takes you step by step a little bit with the uh, development from the original sketches to the finished work. The tight time frame of thesis and my desire to allow myself revisions until very late in the process helped me make this decision. And that decision turned out to be useful because of this. <laughs> Perspective and crowd shots. What did I get myself into? <laughs> From a scheduling standpoint, this was perhaps my biggest challenge. Just producing the digital paintings for pages like this took upwards of 40 hours apiece. Spread across 40 pages means I spent a lot of time at my Wacom tablet. The extra eight pages also ensured that I was able to include something else that was important to me. Educational material. Now, this is history, after all. And one of the things I hope readers take away, along with an entertaining story experience, is a little information about the tradition of timber frame construction and why barns were built. The tools, by the way, <laughs> are pretty impressive. I never knew there were so many different types of axes. The installation that accompanies the book allowed me to put some of my research into practical application, and no, I didn't get a chance to use any of those axes. I had the wood milled from fallen trees with the rough-hued texture of the period, uh, and then I measured and cut each piece. And I'll admit here, there may have been one or two power tools involved. And then I brought it into the city, where my classmates and I had our own barn raising of sorts. I like this so much, we're gonna watch it twice. And it's back on the floor. Here we go. And up. OK. It's my hope that the installation recreates, at least in a small way, the feeling of what it's like to stand under the frame of a barn during construction. Supplemental materials speak not only to the history that inspired the story, but to the process and tradition of the barn raising. And then in the trough sits the book. And the story begins. In 2010, my grandfather's barn was destroyed by a tornado. More than 100 years of history and a significant part of my childhood was gone in a moment. But the place remains, and I'll be visiting it. This book is, among other things, a love letter to a childhood spent in and around this building. Because a barn is not only a practical building, but to a kid, it's also a huge, mysterious and magical place full of possibilities. My name is Walter Tyler and my story is The New Barn. I'll take questions. The question is, do I see the book as being a tool for something in addition to being the story? Yes. Certainly, I think so. I think that's one of the, the advantages of producing books for uh, children as an audience. It's not only the opportunity to tell a good story, but to educate and inform. And I think that uh, one of the unique opportunities with this particular book is to really kind of showcase how barns were built at t the time, and that children, while not traditionally participating in that process, like today have a greater opportunity to grab wood and materials and attempt to make their own projects. So certainly I hope 
kids were to pick up the story and read through it and think I could do something like that, even in a craft capacity. We're going to pass the mic for other questions. I think that's a little bit better. Other questions? Nobody? I have one. <laughs> um, so um, the farming industry in this country is, has a complicated history and complicated current state. Um, do you think, and it's also, you know, in many ways a dying, um, a dying part of our history. So is that something that you were interested in um, you know, bringing, bringing to light and um, kind of, you know, giving a new, a new voice to? Was that something that you were thinking about? Um, the history of agriculture in the America, I guess? Definitely. I think that in some ways it's an overlooked history and it's taken for granted a little bit. Family farms are rapidly disappearing in this country. It's often uh, that the land is more valuable than the crops that can be produced on it. Uh, and certainly so many things are imported from abroad, which I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It certainly benefits a lot of other countries and it you know, benefits people who can afford um, to buy those things cheaper here. But it does mean that that kind of like culture that I grew up with is not as present and people are not as aware. And I think that you do see even city kids taking the opportunity to go out to rural farms and do weeks during the summer so they can learn more about it. So I think there's definitely an interest. I think kids like enjoy planting and making and, and doing things and certainly they love animals and, and uh, you know, like reminding them that that was like a key part to the settling of this country uh, is definitely on my agenda. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I just want to comment on your delivery, which was so absolutely heartfelt and so emotional. And um, it's one of your, I mean, I don't know you, but I think it's one of your strengths or your greatest strength. Um, I would just hope that your books, this one, and everything you produce in the future has that, that you honor that, that deep emotional pathos that you obviously have and it's a gift. So I would just embrace it. Thank, Thank you. you. No other questions? We'll, we'll go to the next presenter. Thanks, Walter. Thank you.